It's time for a day on the homestead. What? 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 The real reason I don't do more vlogging, I can't listen to heavy metal at the same time. Lots to do. I have a little list here and stuff that's not even on this list. This morning I made a list of the different stocks I want to graft to and the varieties I want to graft to them now. Almost all of these, there's a few exceptions, are my own seedlings. And of course, you know, it's one thing to breed up these new apples, but then I have to get them out there, which means I need scion wood. So for instance, I'm super excited about amber wine. That would be going out this year, but just a couple of friends are gonna get maybe some small sticks of it because I have no scions. The tree produced a bunch of fruit last year and the longest scion is probably like three or four inches long. So I'll be grafting that for instance to different places like established trees mostly. And, and I might put in a row of trees on seedling roots that will be just for growing scion wood. We'll see about that. That's like a bigger project, but I may look around to see where I would site that, where it's going to be convenient, protected from deer, and I can put it on some kind of mulch, like maybe a weed cloth or something, something really easy, and some automatic water to make sure that they grow. Last time I did this, almost all the trees died, <laughs> except there's a couple of stalks left um, in that spot that I may graft over to new stuff. So that's a big project today, but there's all kinds of stuff to do, so let's just get on it. All right, first thing, fill up the water at the spring while I still have lots of energy in the morning here. Later on, I'll, I'll put it off till evening and then I'll be like, uh, I don't want to. I like getting my water fresh out of the spring, putting it in glass, you know, all the other water systems here, just this uh, irrigation line poly crap sitting in the sun. So who knows what kind of chemical estrogens are leaking out of that. You know, I don't want to grow breasts or anything like that. A lot of uh, health problems today are probably due to causation is very hard to nail down on anything, but it certainly can't be helping. And, you know, there's studies coming out now that there's microplastic just everywhere. Like it's literally in the rain now. So there's no escaping it. And over this, uh, you know, next century, that's gonna be a huge problem to solve. Dealing with that, like how do we, you know, detox that stuff out of our bodies constantly because the exposure is gonna be inevitable. And, you know, we don't, it's gonna be very, very difficult. Again, causation is really hard to nail down. So you can't really say, oh, it's this, and we're just gonna take this, you know, deal with this chemical or whatever. I don't have, nearly that much uh, faith in science to figure all that out. So I think it's gonna be more like general approaches like fasting um, and other interventions to just kind of generally keep moving that junk out of our bodies. And, you know, we have natural systems for that already because just eating, you know, creates toxicity in the body. There's just, it's just a reality. But, you know, if it's overwhelming all the time and you have all these new substances that maybe your body isn't so good at getting rid of, we're going to have to have interventions to deal with that. That's what I think is going to happen. So here's a tree that I could actually do some grafting on just to produce scion wood. So this is a seedling that just popped up here near the spring once and I've been kind of training it just to experiment. And uh, so I do want to leave, you know, a branch to fruit to see what it is, but the rest of it could get grafted over. So for instance, I could graft these two branches over to one of my seedlings for scion production. And then, you know, I have a bud there that's notched and these clips are modified a little bit to like guide the bud outward. I'm hoping that if I just put that on here now, when this bud grows out, it'll hit that and then go outward more. And I may work on like a more modified version of this uh, as well. And then so this bud and that bud will grow out as whatever the seedling is. So we may be back here later to put some grafts on that thing. In fact, there's another one. I think that one's grafted to Sweet 16, but at this point I could just use it for scion wood production. And let's do that again. Yeah, anyway, it's cool to get my water like this, but after 15 years, it gets kind of old. You can see how skinny this is at the bottom. It's actually way fatter up here. That's because this was inside of a tree tube, and that can really screw with the, you know, tree. It's kind of like having your leg in a cast is basically what it's like. So this actually increased a lot in diameter. It was even way skinnier than that, and I have it staked so that there is some stress on it. Like, it can really flop around here. But ideally, this would be staked, a stake about six inches on either side, and then in a couple places have strings coming in 
that loop around this, not tied tight, just kind of loop like this is looped here. And that way this can move between those stakes a lot, but it won't actually fall over. And that stresses the tree, right? Without stress, it's not gonna grow the stem. It's like, it's just gonna grow up here instead. Let me look at the diameter up here is twice as much as down there. Okay, so I didn't bring my clippers, but I think we can get by without. Okay, I'm thinking Appaloosa and Rubiot Pink Lady Cross, which is very, very promising. So I wanna get a lot of branches of this grafted out. I mean, this is the kind of scion wood I have off a lot of those seedling trial row varieties. Hopefully this is out of reach of deer. You know what, maybe I should uh, put it further out here. That's not a very good bet actually with the deer. I'm gonna put this apple up here where the deer definitely can't reach it. And I'm just gonna cut a little bit off this because it's much thicker. Can you see that? And so that's about the amount I wanna take off of this branch. And then I'm just gonna cut in here, nip that off. Let's clean that up. So there's not, you don't want a bunch of like dead pieces of wood hanging off your graphs there. That's not bad. I think it'll take whip and tongue here. The reason I'm not gonna cut myself doing this is because I'm not pushing on the knife very much. I'm actually pulling the knife like in a slicing motion. I hope you guys can see this. I'm pulling the knife in a slicing motion. Otherwise with my hand right there, it's like extremely dangerous. Same here, see I'm, I'm putting the knife in I get started and then I slide the knife this way to make the cut in a really controlled way. And it's also better because it, it just makes a better cut. You know, if you push on it, it's just gonna sort of split. This cut is not deep enough. One of these isn't deep enough. Well, neither one of them's deep enough. Okay, that's definitely deep enough. Usually before grafting season, I dump this out somewhere on a floor and just go through it and throw a bunch of trash away and organize it. It's pretty messy right now. Just wrap this up. I'm gonna take all these buds off of the stock that are on this branch because I don't want any of those to grow. Good chance some of them will re-sprout and grow anyway and I'll have to deal with those later. But we want this branch to push all of its growth into this. And as you can see from this grew from here to there last year, it's right at the spring, so it gets a lot of water. And when I come up here to get water, I'll pee on this tree sometimes just to make it grow more. And wrap your grafts tight and then wiggle check them. Each wrap that you do, like wrapping over the same spot, will compress and strengthen the graft more. It literally keeps adding more compression each time. So then I'm gonna wiggle test this and I don't wanna see any movement in this joint. So do that before you walk away from your grafts. And we could recycle an old tag here, if I can untangle this. This is why I clean out my grafting thing every year. I'm gonna put this over here where it could still blow off in the wind. So I'm gonna make a twist here and then I'll just kind of wrap this loosely None of this is wrapped tight. We'll cross out black strawberry and write the nickname of this apple. Right now it's Pinker Lady. Huge pink flushed apple with, it's really fun to eat with none of the negative characteristics of red flushed apples. And let's put this here. Yeah, I think the way to go is when these grow out next year, I'll graft more stuff onto them if I'm still around. Uh, just to produce cyan wood, I can come back and harvest cyan wood off it. Now, I don't want these to fruit at all because this is not protected from bears at all. There's no electric fence, there's no nothing. The bear's gonna come along and just pull this over and break it and take the fruit. So if any fruit forms, I will probably just pick it off. So one measure of how my health is doing is if I can grab this three gallon jug by the neck and just walk all the way back to the house. And on a good day, I don't even really notice. On a bad day, I'll make it like 15 feet and have to switch hands. 
Um, I haven't had a day like that for a long time. On a medium day, I'll make it halfway and have to switch hands. All right, let's check on the progress of this cherub tree that we looked at in the last video, the uh, last vlog where I was training this tree. And I notched three different buds that I wanted to grow, and I took off most of the other buds. I notched this one, I notched that one, notched this one, left two buds there, and then pretty much took everything else off. This is trying to regrow even though I picked the bud out. There's secondary buds on either side of the main bud and that's trying to grow, so I wanna pick that out. And I left some extra buds up here that I really don't need. I'm gonna leave like three of those for now. And then since I walk by here all the time, I'll just kinda, of, you know, pick some more out as things start to grow and I can observe it. Of the buds that are left, the ones I notched are obviously growing a little more. So this one here is showing leaf tips. This one here is showing leaf tips. I'm hoping you guys can see all this. Oh, this one here I notched and it looks about the same as the other buds. There is definitely a trend toward the ones that I notched growing more. I need to get some kind of clothespin or something on this. In the past, what I've done is just wait for them to grow out a bit and then bend it, but occasionally you break them. In fact, I broke one in a video. I think the solution is just some kind of little clip, like a, clo a modified clothespin or something. So, you know, we may work on that today, uh, just doing a quickie, modified clothespin experiment. Let's uh, let's try to do that today. Okay, a couple things in the greenhouse here. This morning I listed all of these cactus in these flats right here, which are my remaining flats from last year. I posted those on like Facebook and Instagram and someone reposted to Reddit. I was up in the middle of the night and I went back to sleep for a few hours and I woke up to just this feeding frenzy of <laughs> orders coming in. So by the end of today, probably all of these seedlings will be sold and ready to ship, which is really encouraging because I was starting to wonder, like my website hasn't been performing very much, like people don't really know about it. And I haven't, you know, really put it out there much. I really want to expand this year and I'm going to try, I hope to try to grow uh, 10,000 seedlings. And so it's really encouraging that if I get it out to the right places, I'll probably sell 10,000 seedlings and some in bulk. Anyway, these are the new flats coming up and I did a bunch of experiments here. So I just want to check on those. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming up in there. You can't see it, it's it's still tiny. And we got new batteries for the solar system and it's been pretty sunny most of the time so I can have this on bottom heat. That matcha tastes terrible. So bitter, nasty. Anyway, what I wanted to do is cut off this graft this morning yeah, so I have a jillion cactus orders to fill now, but also all the cyan and seed orders that are flooding in, which is amazing. Um, there was a real feeding frenzy yesterday with the top tier patrons, and then another one this morning with the $10 and up patrons. That's really great. We're going to get a, some money to put away for land. Although that's not the solution to getting land. I need more um, like passive income sources writing and patreon cutting this off right above this bud graft right here so this is like a chip graft the same kind we use for fruit trees i'm kind of working on trying to figure out a system to make this convenient and easy it just uses very little propagation material and you can put like a bunch of grafts around this is a different kind of graft right here so now because i kind of cut it at a slope this is the highest bud here, or these, these buds are kind of the highest, and hopefully the plant will favor those and make them grow. But what we can do to encourage that is just check around here. Okay, so like here's, can you see that little bud right there? We'll take that out. And then the reason I round all this is because the cactus will dry up and form like a dish here, and that'll catch water. So if there's any high spine clusters that might decide to grow instead of growing my graft here. Just like a fruit tree, I can just nip these out and those little spots will heal up no problem. You can see here where I failed with uh, one of these chip bud grafts and it's just, it's all healed up and fine. Hit it with some peroxide because I didn't even wash my knife because peroxide fixes everything. And we'll save this for I don't know what. You can see on this one that I already cut back here. Even though I cut it, sloped it back a little bit, 
it's still dishing out and that'll kind of tend to catch a little water but over time it'll fill in and it's still sloped enough that it'll probably be okay so i'm just hoping that busts out and starts to grow in the next week or two let's go modify some clothes pins for that other tree i've been setting up some indoor studio space here so i got this really cool light that's adjustable and it's very very bright I just got this, which is like an adjustable camera arm. I can actually put my big camera on here with the heavy lens and have this be really adjustable for shooting stuff uh, for cooking. And then right here, I have the exact same setup. I just bought another one of those arms and another quick release so I can just flip the camera back and forth. I have Velcro on the ceiling, pull that light down, stick it up here, pop a camera in there with the quick release and I'm ready to shoot. And then this space is more for like, oh, like crafts. And you know, it's more of like a workbench. I got tools over here and uh, stuff. This is also my shipping station with all my boxes and envelopes and stuff. So just to get prepared, cause I'm doing a lot of grafting today, I'm gonna clean and reload my strop. So this is full of like polishing compound and you know, it's loaded up with steel and everything. So, and this is just turpentine, but it's high grade turpentine. People don't understand turpentine. They think it's some kind of chemical, which obviously it is, but it's a natural chemical. This is no different than essential oil of anything, right? So like if you had essential oil of oranges, like that orange cleaner, or rosemary or peppermint for cooking, any of that. In fact, I eat this sometimes. Very, very long history of use as medicine. I've spent a couple days compiling research about that, but I haven't done anything with it yet. It's good for parasites. Like people used to use it for all kinds of stuff, but it was real common to take it several times a year, uh, just as a general tonic or for a parasite to prevent parasites. Rub this hard enough that it starts to melt. There we go. And I can see that there's a good layer of this polishing compound on here. I don't know which polishing compound this is. It's just one I happen to have and it seems to work. This is another great thing to have around, just period. Um, you can use stiff cardboard if you want, but maybe just like a little board like this and make several and just glue different grades of sandpaper between about 320 and uh, 2000. This one is probably four or 600. So like, let's say my grafting knife gets dull, but I don't wanna go through a full sharpening. This is a good step to do right before stropping because it's just a little bit more aggressive, but it's still really fine and it'll put a fine edge on tools. And then, you know, if it gets dull, you can just glue another piece of sandpaper on it. You could have two different sides. Very, very handy, very cheap way to make a great sharpening tool. Okay, so then I'll go to this. And this will avoid a lot of like full on resharpening. And then I can just carry this in my back pocket. And while we're at it, we'll just hit my clippers with that real quick. I mean, you can really hear that it, it is actually cutting decently well. It's not going to sharpen something that's really dull. It's just a touch up. Here, I'm going to eat some of this now just so you believe me. Now don't do this. Well, don't do it at all until you do some research and make your own decisions. I'm not recommending that you do this. I'm just showing you that I do it all the time. So I usually take maybe like 10 to 15 drops. So there's like 12, 13 drops. So don't go to the hardware store and buy this crap that's called turpentine. It is turpentine, but it's made with like, you know, industrial processes. And this is actually pure gum spirit. So that means that they took the actual pine pitch collected from the trees and distilled it pure. And it actually tastes really good. Well, I can't find, I know I have some super glue and some epoxy, but I can't find either one right off the bat and I don't feel like looking. I got an idea here. So imagine this is clipped on the tree like this and there's a bud right here. I want the bud to grow out and up. So I want a little bit of slope to that. Maybe put like, you know, 15 degrees or something. The bud comes out, it hits the slope and it starts to go out. But as soon as it gets here, it's probably gonna go straight up. So the idea here is to guide it further 
out at an angle to kind of set that growth outward. Now it seems ideal to kind of glue something on there, but I'm just wondering if I could just do this and then bend that. So that makes this nice, soft, flexible thing that's gonna push that outward. So the only real question is whether I can still clip this onto a tree because um, you know this piece of metal's in there now. And let's go ahead and crank that down too. Wait, let me try one more thing first. Okay, so, sorry I forgot to turn the camera on, but all I did is I put a drill bit in here and I hit it with a hammer. So this is cool because now this actually will stay on here permanently uh, without, you know, being careful with it. And then I could uh, just take it off too and use it as a clothespin. So I'm glad I didn't find my epoxy or my super glue. This is cool. So what I'm gonna do now is just make a better one because that drill bit wasn't big enough and I didn't bring the index out. Even though that little voice in my head was like, take the whole index. And I was like, yeah, I don't need that. And it was like, no, take the whole index. And I didn't listen. I do like this clip because it has a bigger hole there. So I'm gonna go see if I can find some more because most of these have a pretty small uh, divot there. Okay, so I'm gonna go through here and pick out the ones with the biggest notches. And let's whip a few of these out. This aluminum is from old printing plates, which I recommend. I've recommended so many times in videos, like if you graft fruit trees, uh, if you have a garden and you need to, you know, tag starts and stuff like that, this stuff is amazing. You can cut it with scissors. I don't even need these tin snips. And if they are still available, they won't be for long because everything's going to digital. You can write on them with pencil. I have probably five gallon bucket of used ones. I mean, I, I make hundreds of these a year. Some of the ones I have in the buckets, like just used and worn out, have are written on four different times. Like they're written on here, and then here, and then here. You know, with di different like vegetable starts or apple seedling names and stuff like that. So look at that. A drill bit that's a similar size to this notch. But if you bend this stuff back and forth too many times, it'll break. In a pinch, you can actually just tear it with your hands. Also like to hit this a few times. Yeah, just right there. And then I can adjust it however I want. Okay, so there's our clip. I could sit down in the evening and make like 50 of these pretty easy. It's gonna stay put. You know, I could throw these in a, a little bucket or something and have them around. If I want to, I could still pull this off and use it as a clothespin. I think we're onto something. This could be like a thing. And, oh wait, we want this bent all the way up like that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna whip out like eight or 10 of them to try out today, but I have a feeling I'll be making like a bunch of these this year. Now the disadvantage of not cutting this slope is that now the bud has to hit this, which is actually pointing backwards and then grow out and then up. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and cut the slope on all of them. But it doesn't take long, kinda mess that up. Yeah, that looks a little better. I didn't do too good of a job on that one, but all right. Put this in here, bend that back, hit that a couple times, turn this on end, tap that back into place. I bet that'll work just fine. Put a little stronger slope on this one, maybe more like 35, 40 degrees. Yeah, you could get super fast at making these things. And of course, if you use glue, you could glue any kind of little piece of sheet metal to this. Soda cans, right? You can cut them with scissors. Yeah, this is gonna be vastly superior to letting the buds grow out and then training them afterwards, something like that. So I'm getting a little bit of a, an effect here where the this slopes out to the side, but I think I can just adjust where I put the clip to fix that. And I wanna leave these long for now. And I'm actually thinking I might put like a little bit of curve into them. So the bud comes out and hopefully grows along this. 
you know, let's try this. We could also, yeah, let's cup this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, this is so good. Yay, I love inventing things. Hopefully this is a historic moment and someday you'll buy a fruit tree from a nursery and it'll come with some kind of clip like this. I definitely like the little trough effect, so we're gonna put that into all of these. I may actually have to make more of these today. I cut most of them on a paper cutter, like I just have an old paper cutter that is pretty much for just these. Yeah, so if you're gonna buy clothespins for this, get something with a big, a big notch, like a lot of these are really small. But if you don't, like if you have some already, just use whatever you have. You can always cut that deeper if you need to. Okay, so there's five. Let's go for like 10. So I've been drawing up a signature knife. I really, I'm excited about it and I really want to take the time to like build a quick prototype. It may only take like a few hours uh, using like stock removal, but I just have not been able to cut out the time for it. This in here, I'm getting my order of things down here. It certainly could use a different hammer for this, like a little peen or something, a little cross peen. Yeah, I've had this idea for about a year or more, just finally getting around to it. This is what your support buys me time to do. If I see something or think of something that might be kind of a game changer or is neglected, area of inquiry. I have a compulsion to do it. About 90% sure this is going to be awesome. Another thing one could do is, it's kind of dinged up a little bit, uh, soak these in linseed oil and they would probably last a lot longer. Okay, this is an improvement. Okay, figured out a couple of things here already that just make this go a little smoother. So one is, before I put the drill bit in, just kind of purposefully bending this really sharp right there. Before I whack it, and then, actually the last one I didn't even whack, I just took the drill bit and kind of pushed it in there. Finagle this down here a little bit better because this stuff is pretty soft and easy to bend. Okay, so easy to make this way, even easier to make with like epoxy. I think epoxy would be a longer lasting solution than, than super glue, but super glue might work too. Glue them on there. You could make 50, 100 of these easy in an evening. But we have 10 of them, so let's try them out. Look, I'm not saying I'm like a horticultural genius but I am. I'm just gonna put my tools and supplies away here because you're watching me. So I don't really know if these lawnmower blades are high carbon steel. I guess that some are and some aren't, but I'll probably use these to build a knife prototype because they're about the right thickness already. Pound this flat, do a quick hardness like test on it to make sure I can actually make a knife out of it. It doesn't have to be a good knife. It's more like, if it'll hold an edge reasonably well and I could get the form down and start testing it. That's the first step. So I could probably do that in like, even the full version that I want to do, I could probably do it in like four to six hours, maybe less. It's on the list. Okay, let's go try these out. We need a good name for these because if there's no name, people can't talk about them. So maybe bud training clips, bud guides. Let me know what you guys think and I'll brainstorm a bunch of names before I release this video, see if we can come up with a good name. And I wanna start, you know, kind of using the Patreon community for stuff like that too, and Instagram, in the blog, get people involved in that kind of thing. Oh yeah, that's gonna work so good. This is kind of loose, I'm concerned about that. So I wanna make sure, yeah, it was just that one wasn't really staying put. I feel like I mentioned this before, but I just have this idea that it would be better overall if nurseries grew tall whips, like really grow them out good, you know, nice tall whips first year and either sent 
instructions on how to train for different methods or set the trees up ahead of time. Now the cool thing is that if you use either of the methods that I usually use, which is modified central leader and delayed open center, the training is actually the same. The only difference is on the delayed open center, you have branch, 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 and then you eventually just cut this off. And that's the only difference. So you could train the trees the same and just send a little instructional thing about it. Ship the tree off with these clips, you know, include them, whatever, instructions on making them, or maybe better, go ahead and do all the notching and disbudding and ship the tree with the clips in place so the person only has to plant the tree let it grow for a year and then if these don't work out you just you have extra branches and you just pick out three branches going in you know three or four branches going in three or four different directions right does that not make sense i mean it adds some work for the nursery but it doesn't necessarily because you know i think it's honestly i think it's better to ship the tree out with instructions because then people are more hands-on and they'll learn something, you know, and, and the reasoning behind all of it and how to, you know, train the tree and adapt if things don't work out. Like say a deer comes along and eats this branch off, but you have another nice branch coming this way and you kind of just reselect stuff. And there's tricks you can you can do to get the form you want still. But the other thing is that usually trees, most trees are shipped bare root at two years old. So they're these big tall things, which I have not found to do better personally. I would rather plant whips than two year trees. And you have a lot less options for training a two year tree. So that way the nursery only has to grow the tree for one year. Now, granted they have to grow it out hard. You know, they have to grow it out really well to get a tall whip that's trainable, which is, you know, it's a thing. You really have to, to push them. Okay, so we're just gonna replace that with that looks perfect and this with that so cool that's gonna work so good and we have a few left over in case i do any more tree training today okay we can take a look at a few daffodil seedlings today they're just starting to come out but uh, these are seedlings that i started years ago and they're just starting to bloom. So this one's, I mean, it's like a nice flower, but there's nothing super distinguishing about it. It's not particularly interesting. This one has a pretty cool pink rim, but it's kind of messed up. It's not symmetrical. It has some notches in this petal. It has a notch in the corolla. Probably what'll happen is like every year, a lot of the flowers will have those kind of defects. So that's probably gonna be a call. Okay, so this one's pretty messy. Like the Corolla is split, but it's not split symmetrically. It's got notches here, notches here. It's just, yeah, it's all different. It's, it's a messy flower. So again, if this produces flowers that look like this next year, I'll call it. There could be a thousand or more of these seedlings planted in this block right here. It's just a little test block. I think a bunch of them have died, so it may not be that many, but it's many hundreds. So over the next... Um, you know, years, this is going to keep flowering. There's lots of flowers coming out here. This one will open in the next couple of days. I think this is a really good one too. It's really fun. Like I get to see the results of all this uh, cross-pollinating I've done. It's a pretty fun project and I, I don't put hardly any time into it. Like during daffodil season, I'll just go out in the morning and grab some pollen. I just pull out the uh, little pollen things here carry them around and apply them and then I don't keep track of anything. I just walk around and look for seeds, pick the seeds, grow them in a flat for a couple of years and then plant them out like this and let them go. So uh, we'll look at some more in the garden. You can see chestnut crab is already about to bust out in the end of February here. Very weird year. Oh, here's something we need to do is take out all of these tags because if I leave them, I'll be confused about what I pollinated this coming year. As you can see, I use chestnut crab a lot for breeding. I just found out about a chestnut honey crisp cross called Kinder Crisp that I'm anxious to try. And as I've said many times, I just think that these small, richly flavored crab derivative apples, stuff that's bred from chestnut crab, Wixen, probably Centennial, Trailman, will someday be 
popular. They have unique traits. When you grow fruit really big, even genetically speaking, it often isn't going to have the richest, most intense flavor. So that's one reason. Plus just with the genetics from the crabs, they have kind of different flavors. And I can't reach those up there, so I'll probably take those down when I pollinate this year. Frankentree is badly in need of a serious hardcore pruning. I will not be surprised if this tree produces hardly any fruit this year. So people have asked about, you know, how much the stock influences fruiting versus like just the genetics. You will see varieties like even on Frankentree here when the, the tree's basically taking the year off, you'll still get a few fruits. So there's, you know, there's influence in both directions. The whole tree has a bunch of varieties on it and it's just spent, you know, because this produced so much fruit last year and it was a drought, it's probably gonna take the year off. But if the variety has a really strong tendency to bear every year, you might still get a few fruits on those varieties. This is my jewel, the banana flavored apple. Um, I was just speaking with uh, Freddie Menge and he's coming up this way to visit. So that's really awesome because we have a lot to talk about. He's an apple breeder. If I have an apple guru, it's Freddie Menge. But this tree has virus. So if he has a clean scion of this variety, my jewel, I'm gonna get it because I know people are interested in it, and even though I don't like bananas, and it's extremely banana flavored, like crazy strong, I'm super interested in what the offspring are going to be like. So I got to send out a few crosses of this. Um, the ones I remember are with Ice Princess in both directions. Someday from this variety are going to come some crazy strong banana flavored apples that are going to be really popular with some people, and I'm just like dead curious about how that's going to turn out. So if you got any of those seeds from me and they fruit someday, let me know how they turn out, good or bad. Okay, what do we have here? Uh, this is grafted to some new stuff that I want, like this right here. So take off competing wood. I wanna take off a lot of competing wood on this tree and try to force some growth into all these grafts I put on here. So this graft failed. That was Irene Red Flesh. I have that somewhere else, I think. And here we have Yellow Bellflower which I've never been particularly impressed with, but this is a very traditional variety around this area. It's a low chill apple if you have chill issues, which is why they grew it out like around here out toward the coast where the chill is super low. King David's another good bet for that. And then most of this top is King David. But again, I kind of want to drive growth into all of this stuff here. So I may come out this year and... Yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. But I'm going to take out a bunch of this wood. Because this stuff down here doesn't really want to grow. It hasn't been growing that good. Probably because of all the competition here. And this is just not a very good tree. It's too dry up here on this hill. I also don't get cyan wood from this tree because I think it might have virus. I can't remember for sure. I need to figure that out and mark it. So this one here is called uh, Crabby Lady. It's one of Freddie Menge's varieties. This is kind of sick here, black, very unhealthy. This is a cross between Wixen and Lady Williams, which I have really not been able to fruit and try yet. It cracks really bad in the fall. He says it's as late as Lady Williams, but better. A little bit smaller with some Wixen flavor is what I understand. I'll get more details on that when I get to talk to him. But yeah, I just want to really cut this way back and see if we can drive some growth into these lower branches. At this point, I'm not attached to getting the fruit off of this tree, and it doesn't perform that well anyway. Let's just take all that off. I love these clippers. This is the Barnell B808, but they have one fatal flaw, which is this cool little clip right here that locks them, and then you squeeze it and it pops open. It wears out super fast. I've already refiled this one twice. I wrote the company at least twice, like an extensive, you know, long email talking about that, basically telling them, look, if you fix that, I will sell these clippers for you. You know, that's why I haven't done a review yet. Didn't even write me back either time. Crazy. Fire your public relations person. I mean, that issue just has to be dealt with. It's, it's a deal breaker because it just, you know, it makes them super frustrating to use and all they have to do is make this out of a harder material. That one little piece right there. I can make it kind of work, but if you just touch it, you know, it pops open in your pocket and it's just a pain in the butt. And you can't just like quick 
clip it a lot of times it'll kind of like fail like what is the deal this is you know the new millennium it's all about who has influence i could probably sell hundreds of these and then you know that has ripple effects as it goes out every other thing about these i love a bear broke this off this year or last year i can't even remember and i'm just gonna hack it this is another tree that's just, it's way too far up on this hillside where it's all dry and it has never done well. It was something else and it's mostly grafted over to grenadine now. Almonds are blooming. Hopefully we won't get a cold snap that's gonna destroy those blossoms. Everyone told me, don't try to grow almonds around here because they won't, they won't fruit reliably. Did I listen to them? No. And they produce almonds most years. This one's been blooming for a while. My pollination here isn't really that good. It looks like I missed some almonds this year. This is probably still good. These are hard shell almonds. Not super hard, but harder than paper shell almonds. So they're harder to crack, but they're also harder for bugs to get in and ruin the nuts. This is a tree I was talking about earlier that's a delayed open center. So the only difference between an open center tree and a delayed open center tree is that the branches are spaced out instead of coming from the same spot. So in a classic vase or open center tree, you chop the tree off, you pick, you know, three or four, however many branches coming out right wherever you cut it off, and then you grow those into this open vase shape. You can see the center of this is kind of open. So with delayed open center, you just come again, coming up, branch, come up, branch, come up, branch, cut this off. And so you get the same form, but it's a lot stronger and longer lived. There's a few peaches grafted on here, but some of them failed. So let's take those off. This is a weak growing tree. It, it would be fine if I would irrigate it and feed it, you know. Peaches like to be taken care of. Definitely pushing the limits of that clipper there. And if there's anything like this that's competing with whatever I grafted, I want to take that off. Franken tree here is going to be a project. I need to spend like a few hours out here just really cutting this thing back and opening it up, getting some light and air in the tree. Probably prune off a few varieties that just have not performed well. As you can see, Pomo Sinel is still hanging here. The texture isn't great, but they actually still taste pretty good. I was eating a couple the other day with my friend Jasmine. A lot of these other apples that you see hanging, yeah, they'll hang on the tree. Like up there is um, probably Rhode Island greening, but it's complete mush. So for the winter hanging apples, they need to meet certain criteria. They need to hang onto the tree just like that, but they also have to ripen late or hang in good condition so that you can eat them in the winter. They have to resist weather, so a lot of these will kind of start blowing out and rotting and stuff and cracking with uh, the rain and the frost and all that stuff. What did I say? Oh, they have to taste good too. I mean, they just have to be good apples. So that's a lot of criteria. But in terms of breeding, I have some pretty good stock to work with. And this is Lady Williams. So Lady Williams ticks all of those boxes. It's not a great apple but it's good and it's worth eating. And his breeding stock, it's great. And this is where, you know, Pink Lady came from this apple. It's, you know, one of the ancestors, but look how perfect that apple is. There's no cracks at all. And it's just still rock solid here in late February. Mm. It's actually really good this year. So not only is it super durable, pretty, hangs the longest of anything I have with those late hanging apples in good condition except for in terms of like you know ripe actually ripening late which is usually February 1st I mean this was edible on February 1st and it's still edible it also has quite a bit of flavor now I wouldn't say like as a flavor package it all comes together really well which is the reason I'm not super enthusiastic about eating them but it's good and it has a lot of kind of you know, fruity complex flavor that I think is passed on into offspring, like Pink Lady, for instance, has this kind of like, you know, if you, if you buy grocery store apples in general, Pink Lady kind of stands out as having a little bit more complexity and kind of tropical mixed fruit flavors. And that probably came from this. My new seedling hard candy cider probably gets some of its very rich uh, fruit candy flavors from this, I would guess, as well. So this is really a good uh, thing to breed those apples with. And before I forget, because we probably just cut through some virus infected wood, I'm going to nuke these with hydrogen peroxide, leave it on there wet 
put my clippers away, and my saw. Could really easily hold a bunch of virusy pulp, so I'm just going to saturate all in here in the teeth. Knock some of that pulp out and put that away wet so it keeps working. Okay, this project's related to a couple previous videos. Uh, one was softening buckskin. So the really big hide that I was softening, I decided to put away and do another day, did not soften. And I couldn't tell it was going to do this until pretty far into the process. But when you age hides for a really long time, they lose bound moisture uh, is what I think is happening. That like from research I did, I think that's what's going on. The fibers become kind of locked together. And I think the process is basically similar to tanning a hide where the fibers are kind of like cross-linked together. So I wasn't able to get it. Uh, even close to soft, especially up at the neck. It just seized up and uh, wouldn't soften. Now, if I'd really, really just beat it hard for, you know, a couple few hours, like it would have turned out better and parts of it would have turned out okay, but it just didn't seem worth it and it wasn't going to turn out to be like your normal, what you think of as brain tan buckskin, which is like soft and stretchy and flexible. I decided to just tan it in a tanning solution. During my big, long, like 16 part tanning series, I had some leftover liquor at some point and I dumped it in this tub because I was like, you know, maybe I'll use that later. And sure enough, months and months later, I have this hide, just threw it in there and started tanning it. What I'm doing today is I'm gonna throw this on the beam and go over the flush side because it was already kind of shrunk up and I put it in here dry, which I don't usually do. But since this is already like all fuzzy and partly softened, it, it was fine. And you can see the color is actually really even except for these rust stains here. The tannin shrinks it even more. So now the skin's kind of like shrunk in. And if I throw it on the beam and scrape over the flesh side, I can get it opened back up so it can, you know, tan faster. We're just going to run over the flesh side of this and put it back. Not doing much here. I'm just really trying to squeeze out some of this liquor so that new liquor can come in and get the hide stretched open. And we'll check this to see how the progress is. I don't know. It should tan really fast because it's already kind of partly tanned and opened up and stuff. But even if it seems finished, I'm gonna put it back and leave it for another few weeks at least. And I have to be real gentle with this because it's not very flexible. It's partly tanned, plus it's really dried out. Like if you took a hide like this that had been aged for years as just rawhide and you didn't tan it or anything, you just had it scraped and stored, it won't behave like you want it to as rawhide. It won't shrink down like, you know, rawhide has this property of shrinking and conforming to things and drying really hard. Well, it won't really do that the same anymore. So if you want rawhide that's really gonna like shrink and conform to things and like you wanna use those properties of rawhide, try to get, you know, fresher skins, process them and use them relatively soon. Sometimes it's to the point where you'll dry the rawhide and it'll dry like white and almost like it's been partly tanned or something. From research I did when I was doing my buckskin book back in the 90s, I found some information that indicated that over time the hide goes through a, cr a cross-linking process which kind of binds the different fibers together just like tanning in bark does or smoking a hide or tanning it in chromium cross-linking processes and that effect is also used with other proteins like there used to be this whole industry making things out of casein which is milk protein by submersing them in formaldehyde you know things like buttons and plastic parts like say a hairbrush handle or something like that this like predates the plastic age basically and it's this extremely durable cool material of course you know whoever's making it has to like work in a formaldehyde danger zone. And formaldehyde will also make hide glue, which is made from skin fiber, waterproof from the same effect. Brain tanned buckskin, you make it 
like with a raw skin and you lubricate the fibers and you soften it and get it all soft and fluffy and then you smoke it. So it's kind of like the reverse process where you're actually tanning the skin by cross-linking after it's already softened. And that is due to aldehydes. I don't know how much actual formaldehyde is in smoke, but some other aldehydes. And there are various aldehyde tannages that uh, tanneries have used for a long time. Somebody commented recently, they're like, you're like an encyclopedia, dude. And I was like, yeah, right? Thanks for noticing. So I have a whole, like, old book from, I think, the... 40s or something called uh, casein and its industrial applications. Super cool old technical book and it talks all about, you know, how to make those plastic buttons and stuff. And they look amazing. Like, you know, they're colored. They look like fake marble and shell and all kinds of cool stuff. It was pretty neat. I don't know if that could be revived as a viable industry and alternative to plastics. Maybe using a different aldehyde that's less toxic than formaldehyde or Something along those lines. I don't know. It'd be pretty neat though because they're they're really neat materials I mean by that time it was developed to this like high art industrial art and then of course plastics just kind of Brushed it all aside and replaced it and now we have microplastic in our rain Maybe worse than having formaldehyde in our buttons. I don't know. So you probably see I am getting some fluffy stuff off of here, that's good. It's gonna make this flush side a lot cleaner. Not necessary, but it's nice. It'll make a, a flatter, smoother, finer grained surface. If you're in a hurry to, t to tan hides with bark tan, do this. You know, you could do it every day, even. Look at all this liquid I'm pushing out and that's gonna have to be replaced by that tan liquor. The more you manipulate the hide, stretch it back out like I'm doing, move liquid out of it and back into it, the faster it's going to tan. And if you do this already and you want to teach it, I've done this process with goat hides. They were already limed, so they were limed and ready to go, but they were, you know, dehaired, flushed, de-limed, put in the liquor, and tanned within five days. So that can work for like a week-long event, or you could do, you know, one day where you set it up, and then a week later, you could finish the hides when they're tanned. I've done that twice at a, I, like a, maybe a six day gathering. So I think it might've taken five days, four or five days, I can't remember. But you know, the students are required to come back every day and mess with the hides. Do this at least once a day, stretch them around many times a day in the liquor. If you do a lot of scudding like this, you can get them de-limed really fast. Just, you know, you put them back in the water and then like an hour later, scut them again, even less than that. And we definitely need more people teaching this skill. Brain tanning has been really popular for a long time, but it's a lot harder to find good bark tanning instruction. Although there's many, many more people that, that are good at it now. You can teach brain tanning in a weekend, but you can't teach this in really in a weekend easily. It might be possible with like some really thin skins, but hey, just a uh, quick rant here. Um, last I remember looking, about six million deer are hunted in the U.S. every year. A lot of those skins go to waste. I would guess more than half of them never make it to any kind of tannery or anything like that. Almost all of the ones that do are sent overseas to be tanned in very toxic tanneries that make like workers sick because they have no regulations. I mean, these guys are literally like wading around barefoot in tanning solutions, toxic like chemical tanning solutions, chromium. I mean, I would imagine that like just as many, if not more, are also killed on the roads every year, which by the way, usually good hides, right? A lot of those are perfect hides because there's no bullet holes in them amazing potential resource, like national resource treasure. The ones that are tanned are tanned really bad, usually. The processes used to tan those are really fast. They're just trying to crank out cheap leather. And so the hides aren't very good. They're weak, they're ugly. You know, those hides could be tanned domestically, avoiding all of the regulations that require us to send our hides elsewhere to be tanned where there are no regulations because if you use natural tanning methods all of the waste quote unquote waste all of the outflow of the tannery is actually useful this stuff useful 
lime, useful, hair, flesh, spent bark, bark liquor, lime liquor, all of it. Not just like you could figure out a way to dispose of it safely, it's actually useful, right? Please. <laughs> we need to pull our heads out of our ass and figure this out. And we could be running around in just gorgeous, amazing, like deerskin jackets and vests and shoes, maybe gloves. This is one of the projects I want to work on. And it's not just about the tanning. Like I'm real interested in micro tanneries right now. And there's a lot of them springing up. There's a bunch on Instagram. In fact, if I can remember, I'll link a list of Instagram accounts that you can follow if you're a tanner and want to follow some of these small, like commercial tanneries that are cropping up. I think one is Billy Tannery, Seven Leagues. Matt Richards in Oregon is traditional tanners, I think. But the main things I want to work on are, are this like integrated model where you have resources coming into the tannery and the tannery is a hub and then all the things that flow in and out of that are related to other satellite industries so you are gonna have a lot of fertilizer right so that can go to growing grass for more cows you could take all the bark waste and char it you can use it to heat greenhouses you could grow mushrooms on it you have if you're cutting bark and you're cutting trees like this tan oak for instance you're going to have a bunch of wood. So you can char the wood. You could you could bring it in and grow mushrooms on it or someone else can grow mushrooms on it. You can make biochar out of it. There's all kinds of ways to use it. You can actually generate electricity from it and you can make biochar at the same time and run your tanning operation. All of this is possible theoretically. You know, organizing it and making it work is a different thing. But the first step is is mapping it out. You know, mapping it out and saying, these are the resources coming in. These are the resources going out. What are the potential different uses for those things? And that could scale from anywhere from like a really small rural, um, you know, farm to like a large scale where you could have a big tannery with a big plantation of tanning materials, right? Like sumac, growing your own tanning material. Makes sense, right? They're... Okay. I'm done. We're just gonna put this back in here and I wanna make sure it gets, you know, real well saturated right away. This solution is really cold, so tanning's gonna progress slowly. Let's uh, check our progress here. I don't think it's actually very tanned. A lot of this is probably just used up. I mean, this hide is like a sponge and it's been in here for a while. There's likely not much left very very little tan and again just because there's color in this doesn't mean that there's any tan and left but it smells good and it's going okay and it's really cold so i'm not going to mess with that today you know like trying to get some more solution made but it's going to have to happen but this is a pretty decent piece of hide and i think it's worth you know it's worth the effort i'm going to go put my gloves on for these this is a a piece of deer hide and a big deer hide that is from one of the deer that I hunted maybe like a year or two ago whenever that I stuck in the freezer and I had to clean up my freezer to make room and so I thought well I better just tan this and I threw it in some lime. So I'm gonna go get some gloves and we're gonna flush those and dehair them. Okay most of this you see on the surface there is not actually bacteria it's lime crust. So that is lime coming out of the solution and forming a crust of, uh, you can hear it, listen. You hear it? It's limestone, that's calcium carbonate. And these look pretty limed, I guess we'll find out. The hair is just coming out, look at that. How the hair is just coming out, that's what we want. So for this I do want my Atlas elbow gloves, yay for Atlas elbow gloves. They're only like 15 bucks. If you're tanning hides, they're really nice. So with a hide like this, it's coming out really easy. You can pretty much just do this because I'm gonna go over this side again anyway to push more stuff out so any remaining hairs will come out. And these actually have like a really good texture that's good for cleaning stuff. I don't have the tool I'd usually use. Hopefully this, this might be a little sharp, but I would use the tool this way. And depending on how the other one goes, I might go grab something and kind of drag the hair out with the back of the knife. But even then you don't want it too sharp. You could even do this with a piece of wood. 
depending again on how easy this stuff's coming out. A few hairs that are kind of trying to hang in here. Since I'm going to go over this again and again several times, that stuff can come out later. I may just throw these right back in the line a few days or something until I get around to them, which could turn into a few weeks with all the spring chores I should be doing right now instead of this. But I just didn't have room to store these and I didn't want to salt them. This hide, a dog ate more than half of it. The neighbor's dog came over to visit several times. And one time I had this laying out, it ate more than half of it, like eight big holes in it. Dogs and hides don't mix. Look, there's like teeth marks all in here. So I'll just cut that off. It's too bad, it was a perfect hide. What's left? is definitely worth tanning. Look at that, all the hair is out. So since I skinned both of these animals, they're very, very clean. I have not flushed this. If anything, I think I might've just maybe like in here, just pushed off a chunk of fat around the edge here and there before throwing it in the lime. Right now, I'm just gonna do a very cursory light flushing. Take off what comes off easy. Do not beat yourself up trying to flush when you're bark tanning at any stage because you're gonna go over the side so many times and just more is gonna come off each time. Just like that's fine. If someone else skinned the animal or has a lot of flesh, just knock most of the loose flesh and meat off before you throw it in the lime. It's a good idea, but the lime is fairly uh, preservative, so you can actually lime fleshy hides. You just, it'd be better if there's not big chunks of stuff on there. And if you can, just do a quick flush before you put it in. And I'll see you when I'm done with this one and we pull out the next one. Okay, so that was a pretty quick process. Just got over the flush side once. We got most of the hair out and I'm gonna put it back in the lime. These have only been in the lime for maybe, probably less than two weeks. They're doing just fine. And in case any of these hairs decide to be stubborn, and because I don't really want to launch into the rest of the process right now anyway, I'll probably put them in there for another week or two. So let's throw this back and get the other one. It's looking pretty good except for these, you know, dog teeth. Hopefully there's not a lot of that. You know, I get really frustrated at dogs, but I get a lot more frustrated at dog owners. It's so many bad experiences. Okay, so this is a big ass hide and the hair is not coming out quite as easy. If I worked on it with the right tool, it might come out. But I have no real reason to do that. And I don't really have a reason to flush it either. So I'm gonna wait until the lime can work on this hide some more and hopefully it'll flush or dehair a lot easier. You can see this is coming out fine down here, but there's just, there's areas where I can see it's a little tight. There's some hairs that wanna hang in there. Like I said, it's pretty cold, so these things take longer in cold weather. The funny thing about lime is it's actually more water soluble in cold than it is in heat. That doesn't mean that it's gonna work faster necessarily, I don't know. For dogs, bears, metal, more metal. Because when a dog or bear knocks this over, I'm gonna hear it. Clean up my beam. And hey, I think I'll even be practice what I preach and pick up all this hair, which by the way is excellent fertilizer. Throw all this under something I want to grow well or in the compost heap, but it's really good to apply it straight to the soil. Mostly protein, things wanna eat it if they can. It's pretty durable protein, but when it's in damp soil, things will attack it pretty quick which is of course what you want because that's what releases the nutrients. Microscopic things eating the hair and then dying and pooping and whatever goes on. Still haven't made a new tanning beam yet. It's on the list. I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to these other tanning tools. This is an apron I bought on Amazon, which I don't think it's gonna last a really long time, but it's decent so far. And uh, I think it's worth recommending. You don't wanna buy the cheapest apron. Uh, it's actually woven fabric that's coated with rubber. So it's not just a chunk of rubber that's gonna start to tear really easy. So if you buy an apron, buy a decent apron and try to get something that's actually woven cloth, rubberized woven cloth. We're gonna, by the way, if you're grafting paint lid gets stuck, take your pruners and use this back edge here to hit it like that. That's what all these chips around here 
Anyway, we're back here at this tree where I made a graft and I just remembered I forgot to coat that. And it's been really sunny and warm, so it's just a better bet to get that thing sealed up with some grafting paint. And it'll grow right through that paint, no problem. All right, I'm just gonna pitch these hide shavings hair under this tree, which is a Franken tree for my seedling varieties, and I'll be grafting more onto it this year, but I definitely want that tree to grow. Okay, we are going to prune Gold Rush here because it's all fruit and no wood. People want the scions. It's just kind of, it overbears a lot. There's such a thing as having too much fruit wood on a tree. You know, it's a nice, healthy tree, bigger than most of these little inner stem trees in here. Cut it back a bit. You start taking off a little bit of fruit wood. I want to leave fruit wood along the tops of the branches because they protect it from sunburn to some extent. Simplify this, thin it out a bit, and doing this will make this produce more wood. And then I'll have scions. Like I just got hardly any scions of this variety this year. Most of them came from in town. So the older the the spur, spurry fruit wood looks, the more likely I am to take it out. And when you're first starting to do this, you're gonna be like, you know, wait, that's my fruit wood, you know? But seriously, this thing is all fruit wood. It overbears all the time. The apples were useless this year because it didn't get pruned or thinned in time. So with some of these that are like hung way down from bearing a lot of fruit, I'll just prune them back to something that points a little more up and that'll grow up fruit and then kind of drop back down. We've got some conflict going here between this tree and this tree, so I'm just gonna take that off. Take some of these fruit spurs off the bottom. Prune that back. Move a little more fruit wood here. The only problem with removing fruit wood, if there's a ton of fruit wood like this, is like maybe in a bad year, the tree might produce a little more fruit if it has a lot more wood on it. Nice thing about these little inner stem trees is they're easy to reach. So I just that could probably stand on that chair there. So in my video archives, I have some videos on making these trees and they have a full size root system, a little section of wood grafted in that's dwarfing, like a dwarf variety. And that dwarfs the entire top of the tree, which is the actual variety. In this case, it's Gold Rush. So it makes these nice little trees that you can maintain easily, but they have a big root system under them, so they're a little better at resisting drought, not falling over. I mean, this is a sturdy little tree. Problem is, they sucker very badly, which is a serious problem. Don't underestimate how bad of a problem that is. And it's very hard to control once it starts. You, you pretty much just have to keep maintaining it. Before the growing season gets going, I need to get in here and try to get these suckers out of there. I don't wanna just cut them off, because if I get under here with a shovel and try to cut them or something, it's more likely to actually prevent them from growing back. So uncrowding this tree will also get a little bit more light, so it'll be healthier, better fruit quality. You want light and air traveling through your tree center. Here's some sugarwood fruits that uh, are still hanging on. That's, a, that's an apple that hangs on the tree. Pretty good. And I wanna hit my clippers, the peroxide, even though I'm fairly certain that Gold Rush tree is not infected with virus. So one thing I'll be doing more in the future is indexing trees to see if they have virus. Ice Princess, very virus prone. So on this tree, it's perfectly healthy looking. On this tree, very virusy looking in the summer. So I can take clean scions, you know, known clean scions of Ice Princess, graft little sticks to different trees and then just watch the growth and that'll tell me if the tree's virus infected or not. There are three spots in this row of inner stems where the trees died and I put in biochar catch pits. So you could probably see how green it is right here. That's one of them. So this year I'll be planting trees in those uh, just to grow scion wood basically for the future. So things like amber wine, uh, cherub, like stuff I want a lot of scion wood of. And also if I get a full tree, 
I can observe that over the next few years and see what it does. And then after I get a new place and I'm not here, I can still come back in the winter and gather cyan wood, um, which is good because I need to produce a ton of cyan wood of that stuff. Okay, here we have a sweet 16 tree. Same thing, I want to get these markers off from pollinating last year. Same thing with this tree, it just tends to overbear a lot and not produce much wood. I'm just gonna take some fruiting wood off of it. Stimulate it to grow. You do want your tree to grow because it's the new wood, the new shoots that grow off of this are gonna produce the new fruiting wood that's gonna look like this later. And eventually all these little spurs and stuff are gonna get tired and need to be replaced. So you want that process to kind of be a little bit ongoing. Again, just another really spurry, modern, high production variety. This variety, which is amazing when it's good, it's absolutely delicious, was pretty useless this year. I mean, I ate maybe eight or 10 of them and there were tons and tons of them due to a little bit to overbearing, but mostly to the drought heavy drought and overbearing in one year. Yeah, I want to prune some more out of here, but instead of grabbing a chair and to stand on or something, I'm just going to wait and get my long reach pruner and I can just work from here. And let's clean this tree of tags and this tree or the one next to it, both King David. One of those is going to get completely cut back and grafted to seedling varieties again for the production of cyan wood assessment, you know, getting more fruit to try. At this point, that's much more valuable than the fruit, which I often just don't even get around to using. Like I had a bunch of fruit on here this year I could have made into something. And that's something that someday when I get a garden and orchard manager, very good friend Jasmine might be interested in that. Fruit testing, right? Pie offs, sauce, drying, you know, testing all these varieties to see what they're really good for, cider, yeah, so I haven't decided which one of these trees I'm gonna hack up yet. I might do this one because it's a lot smaller. Yeah, on this tree I could kind of take everything off. Oh yeah, this is a mess right here. So this I'd come all the way back like down to here, grow a new top, keep like four branches coming out and each one of those branches will be grafted to new stuff. We'll see, I mean, this is pretty, that's pretty messy. So I may have to just come back all the way to the stub. So there's one scaffold, two scaffold, three scaffold, four scaffold. Take everything else off the tree and then whatever I graft on there is just gonna go boom. Probably fruit within two or three years. And I'm just gonna cut this off and commit to that right now. I'm gonna cut a little high, I'll, I'll come back. This is the value of this tree to me now, is just growing using it as a stock to grow stuff. Kind of sad, but. Let's look at some more daffodil seedlings. So this whole bed is a test bed for seedlings. This is awesome. This one right here, which needs a name something along the lines uh, regarding like symmetry, because it looks amazing. It's so symmetrical and gorgeous. This is one of the very first ones to bloom. And this girl was visiting and she's like, oh, it's perfect. And I was like, that'd be a cool name for it. You can see I have this one marked. Some of these are marked for further observation. I'll move them somewhere else. Like this is a mess. It looks like scrambled eggs. <laughs> so, and this is produced like this many years in a row. So this one's ready to call. You know, that's okay, but it's really just nothing to write home about. It's not that appealing. This one, same thing. It's, it's okay, but it has a lot of notches in the petals and it doesn't look that good. What do we have here? I mean, that's cute, pretty lackluster. Now this one is awesome. Hopefully you can get an idea of how awesome that is. This one's definitely a winner. It's been performing really well when it opens out. It's very symmetrical. It doesn't seem to have any real problems. Very nice. The only thing about this one is that these petals are real thin. Uh, a lot of modern dafts have very thick, substantial petals, so it lacks substance, you know. That is an issue. Like, they don't last as long for cut flowers. So, you know, this is pretty floriferous. I already cut one flower and then you know there's three more flowers on this cluster so that's getting moved out 
for sure and marked. You know, this one is, yeah, look at all these messed up notched petals on that. It could just be that one, but I'm seeing some on there too. That's a different one. You know, I'm not going to throw this one out. I'm not going to dig it out and throw it in the compost pile like I am with that scrambled egg one. Chewed up. Looks like a dog that's been in a bunch of fights. But while we're, while we're on it, let's dig this one out because if I don't do it now, I'll forget. Sorry, buddy. Lost the genetic lottery here. Scrambled eggs. It's almost neat, but it's not. So the process of vetting these things, you know, for many years, a number of seasons, and then just seeing how they perform. You know, are they gonna produce a lot of flowers? Are they healthy? You know, it's a little bit of a process to get through that. After that, I'll probably start selling bulbs of the very best ones. I'm pretty sure this isn't a winner here. That's just gorgeous. I don't know. I was thinking a, a cool thing to do might be to like auction off the name. If you win, you get to name it after your girl. Not that you'd have like sole rights to the flower or anything, but you get to name it and then be like, look, I named a flower after you. That's a lot better than buying flowers. Most of the girls I fall for don't even like flowers. I probably like flowers more than they do. Okay, in the last garden vlog, I planted all these tree collared seedlings and the birds are eating them. So I covered them up. They all have leaves now. They look good. That doesn't mean that they're rooted, but I think they probably are, a lot of them. We'll find out if they keep growing, basically. I'm not gonna dig them up or anything. They'll either keep growing or they won't. I also air layered some tree collars, which means I just took off a ring of bark and then wrapped them in a little plastic baggie of, look at that, that one has roots. Woohoo! Took a little ring of bark off down here, wrapped this in, I think it was just crushed charcoal actually on that one. And we have roots. Uh, they are not big, strong roots, but there's lots of them. And that's really good because usually when you root these in a pot, they just produce a few long, skinny roots, like one root sometimes. So having all these like new roots coming out, that's actually really great. You take off all these leaves. Let's not put them in the gross sheep wool. Speaking of hair for mulch, because I'm gonna eat these for dinner. Smoked fat back, traditional Southern style. Also very traditional other places. Cooking greens for a long time, especially big, heavy, substantial greens like this with salted pork is like a normal, very common way to eat greens. And I'm gonna go get a little bit of water so I can immediately dip these things in water. So now that this is washed off, hopefully you can see uh, just how many lovely little roots are on there. I mean, that's like, it looks like hair. That's amazing. This may end up being my go-to method. So I have to unwrap these first to see if they're actually growing roots. I'm not gonna just cut them off. It's called the air layering. It works good on a lot of plants. Good way to do evergreen plants, you know. That has some roots, not as many, but plenty. Now you're gonna notice that I don't leave anything on these. I think on the last one I cut a leaf in half because it has some roots, but that's, that's enough. And you don't need that much. I could cut that off too, but since this has a few roots, it can probably support that leaf. You just wanna balance your roots and your tops. Good rule of thumb. If you're taking off a bunch of roots or taking it off the stem in this case, don't leave a bunch of leaves because it can't support them and it's just gonna, those leaves are gonna suck the plant dry. And all those leaves are gonna die anyway, even if the cutting survives. So just take them off. These cuttings have plenty of stored energy in the stems to grow new leaves with no roots, let alone with some roots on them. Good, we have roots on that too. And if you're new here, this is a variety of tree collards that I grew from seed. I call it Peasant King. And the goal is to get enough of this growing that I can start taking cuttings and selling them. And now I'm probably gonna do this. So if I do this and I leave it longer and I take better care of it, keep this you know, more moist. Usually when you do this, you control the moisture in here and make sure that it's not too wet and not too dry. This is actually very dry, like to the point where it's almost surprising those roots are 
growing and surviving. But of course the plant's giving off a little moisture and that probably kept it damp enough. Anyway, I may do this in the future, but leave it longer, get more of a root mass on here and sell the cuttings as already rooted. That's a big advantage because honestly they just, you know, I'm gonna take this leaf off. There's already a new leaf coming out there because that has very little root. They just don't root that reliably and at least they haven't for me. So shipping out cuttings like that with roots already on them, like wrapped in a nice little ball of fluff, plastic bag or something with some potting mix in there, they'll be ready to go. So I should probably do that one. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna cut around in a ring and then we're gonna go up, say half an inch or so. I'm not sure it matters that much. Cut it again, try to carefully remove the bark in between. We just wanna damage it, but preferably leave a little bit of cambium layer on this stem. You know, we don't want to carve it down until we're like cutting through the wood. It's just about removing that little ring of bark right there. And let's go grab a handful of charcoal and we'll just put one of these back on. Just a big pile of charcoal here. Pretty sure last time this is all I did was just grab some of this. Pick out some chunks. Seriously, I, I did this so fast last time I just wasn't careful at all. And there's a reason for that, which is then I know what I can get away with, right? I could be paranoid about it and I could say, oh, well, what if it fails? And I wanna make sure it survives. No, just throw it together if it works consistently. I just found out how little work I need to do, or maybe I could even do less. Really what that's about is just weighing the consequences of failure. Like, is it a big deal if I fail? Not really. That information is invaluable that I can just do this, just like that, do a funky ass job. Don't worry about the moisture content, right? It's like, well, that charcoal's damp, works for me. We'll find out if it works for the plant. Apparently it does, done. I'm pretty sure I already checked some of these, but I'm gonna check them again. And I don't remember which ones I checked, so. But that one was 100%. This one's gonna have roots, I know it. So I'm pretty sure in another vlog way back, I cut these back so that they would grow these shoots and then I could take cuttings and do this. Oh yeah, that definitely has roots. Cut that at the base. Yeah, lots of nice roots on there. Pretty soon here, I'm just gonna start cutting them off instead of examining them first because I have a feeling they're all rooted. I checked some and I didn't think I saw roots, but I think now I'm thinking maybe they were and I just wasn't looking for those little tiny roots. So if I see any roots, almost, I'm gonna cut it. And I see roots. Yep, lots of nice little roots. Okay, that's it. I'm just gonna cut them off. We'll get these planted. That's a good project to tie up probably for the evening, which is really late afternoon, but it feels like evening. Yeah, this one's a little messy, so I'll unwrap this and take a look at it. Looks like I really winged it on this one. But the top's open, so it probably had a lot of water in it. Hopefully that's a good thing. Yeah, that actually has longer roots than the other ones. Less roots, but longer. These things are a really good animal feed. Chickens love them. You can feed them to rabbits, cows, goats. Anything that eats plants is probably gonna love these things. If you you can grow these in your climate, they're, they're pretty, you know, they don't really like super cold climates, so you're not gonna grow them outdoors in Michigan or anything. But where they'll grow, they'd be definitely a good plant in any kind of integrated herbivore animal system. Put them all around the edge of a chicken coop, right? They're gonna get all that chicken poop and grow like crazy all winter long and you can just keep cutting them and throwing them in there along any other animal pen. In this one, I'm just gonna assume it has roots and cut it off. Tons of roots. You see all this little white dots here? Can you see that? That's all potential root that's starting to bust out. So once this is planted, a lot of those might grow out into roots. And look at this beautiful color. Peasant King. And we have one here where like this is all dead. I'm just gonna cut this way back. Carefully. This time, I'm not going to wound the tree. I'm not gonna take off that ring of bark. I'm just gonna wrap it up in some charcoal and see if it makes roots. You know what I'll do? I'm gonna do this. Just cut a slit. Let's see if more roots grow out of the slit or not. Or if maybe it won't grow any roots. And you know what? 
Let's just put it in dirt this time. And I'm gonna wrap this whole big fat stem and that, if I can figure out how to get this in there. There's a lot of new shoots coming off lower down in the plant. I don't wanna mess those up because they're more potential new plants in a few months here. that'll work good enough is kind of a motto around here I don't have time to be a perfectionist it's a waste of time how do you find out what you don't have to do you take chances push boundaries that information is extremely valuable I may be finding out that I probably don't have to even make that little ring around the bark maybe do nothing maybe just make a couple of slits just because other people usually do air laying by like conventional wisdom by taking off a ring of bark doesn't mean that you have to or you have to for every species or it's just common knowledge which is a lot of times not very reliable there's my dinner cook that up with some leeks and salt pork also in the last video we trained this bite me tree i'm going to apply my little clips here that one doesn't look too promising, but I'm hoping it'll sprout out and do what I want it to do. And then there's another one right here. That's going to work. That's going to be great. The other one was right here. Finesse this a little bit. Now this one, I'm going to put the clip a little bit far above the bud so it can kind of grow out, bump into it, and then go up. It just looks like that's going to work better. Okay, so this whole bed is just for growing tree collared cuttings. So I'm just gonna continue that, put one there, one here, there, here, there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I probably need to replace one of the old ones anyway. Plant this nice and deep. Look at that. That's all potential root. That's rooting points trying to root probably the plants can be like oh i don't need to grow a few of these whatever that's fine but those are capable of picking up moisture and nutrients right now so that's going to help it get established okay six there go back in here and replace one of these this one died perfect this needs to be weeded a little bit where's my interns water those in this does not look happy either because it doesn't have very much root or because something down there is eating it. Could be either one. So relieve it of some leaves, hopefully it'll recover. Pretty much 100% these are gonna get eaten by birds if I don't cover them. And we're off. Finally, the Peasant King tree collard project is off the ground a little bit. Took years. This tree collard's grown from seed, so is that one. Both of them are flowering. By the way, these are good to eat. Just as rapini, saute them in butter, or drop them in salted water for like a minute or two. Peasant King, not flowering. It's been pretty good, uh, consistent about uh, not flowering. Very often, I've seen it flower once. Uh, so maybe every so many years it'll flower. Okay, no grafting tonight. It's time for me to start winding down. I'm running on too little sleep to keep going tonight. Indoor work, maybe take a quick nap before dinner. I'm going to get these on, cooking, not all of them, not, I'm not eating all those tonight, but I'll eat a lot of them, maybe a third of those. So in the event that I get my act together, get some money for land, I'll probably try to document the whole process of moving quite a bit in this kind of format, because there's going to be a lot of things to do, like taking cuttings, rooting things, moving things, you know, establishing a new place, planning around that place and what it's like, all that stuff. Hopefully. We'll see that happen. Okay, signing off.